Welcome back. Uh, it's time to round out the course. So let's take a quick look at what we've been doing through the semester. So thus far in the course, we started off by looking at R and essentially drilling a little deeper into R than we had done in the previous course. After all, in the previous course, our focus had been more on uh, understanding uh, data analytics techniques, uh, supervised learning, classification, regression, and those things. And I taught you just about enough R to be able to get through all of that. Okay, so we did get a good grounding in R, but the focus was not on learning R itself. It was instead on facilitating data analytics, predictive uh, analytics. Okay, uh, so that's what we had done in the last semester. This semester, we went a little deeper into R to understand some more things in R and uh, enable us to essentially be uh, comfortable with using R as an analytics platform. So we did that. Uh, then, of course, we went on to look at a whole suite of uh, R packages, mainly dplyr, ggplot2, and some other things that were sort of behind uh, tidy R, right? And some of these packages which were behind uh, deep dplyr and tidy R and so on. So we learned all of these packages. And what that did was that enabled us to be able to comfortably handle very large data sets, even upwards of a million rows actually, although uh, I think the largest data set that we touched upon in the class was about 300,000 plus rows, but the same techniques would apply even if we had millions of rows. Okay, so uh, even our laptops, small computers can handle lay data sets that are incredibly large, uh, like a couple of million rows, right? So we learned that, then we learned about the process of using such large data sets, reading them in, and then generating some hypotheses about the data from them in terms of how certain variables are related to each other and things like that. And then we were able, we also learned how we can very quickly construct our code that would help us to uh, evaluate some of these hypotheses that we can generate, right? So we learned dplyr, we learned uh, how to use pipes and how to construct uh, expressions which you know write a series of three or four or five uh, piped expressions which would produce the summarized data that we're looking for. Right? And then of course we also learned how to use ggplot to provide a more concrete visualization of the insights uh, that we gain by, the, by this process of analysis. Right? So all this, what it has done is given us the ability to take a look at unstructured, fairly large data sets, which are not uh, organized in a ready form for analysis, but we learned the techniques to be able to, uh, to beat this data into a form that is suitable for analysis and then go on to perform uh, fairly sophisticated analyses very quickly and to visualize such analysis, right? So that's really been the focus of the course. And so now the net result is that when you walk into an organization and there is some data for you to analyze, uh, I think you're now in a position where you can very quickly show your analysis metal to, uh, to, the, for, to benefit the organization, right? So you'll be able to take the data, uh, analyze it, produce reports, produce visualizations, uh, generate some kind of insights and understanding about how things in the data set are related to each other and produce a meaningful report that could guide action, right? So you now have the ability to do all of these things. And then we went on to look at text mining, which uh, is one of the things that is uh, becoming of increasing importance because there's a lot of textual data that's around nowadays. As we discussed, you've got uh, Twitter, you've got posting on Facebook, you've got blogs, you've got emails, all kinds of textual data that is around which needs to be analyzed. And which, of course, being not numeric tabular data, it requires different kinds of approaches uh, for making sense of it, right? And then we got started with, with some of the techniques of textual analysis. First of all, we learned about how to handle strings and just do things like that. We learned regular expressions, which uh, is extremely, uh, regular expressions are an extremely powerful adjunct to analyzing textual data. So we learned that. And then we went on to look at some of the things you could do with textual data. So for example, uh, counting word frequencies, organizing word frequencies, plotting 
word usage patterns, similarities and differences. And then we also looked at sentiment analysis, which is to uh, take a set of words or you know some chunks of text and to be able to analyze the overall sentiment that is expressed by a chunk and then on to go on and use this sentiment analysis to analyze certain documents we looked at that and then finally we also learned how to create word clouds right so we have done quite a bit in terms of textual analysis as well okay and uh, clearly all the examples we have used have been real life examples that indicated fairly large amounts of data so thus far we have definitely developed the ability to handle large data sets but in the industry when the term big data is used that term connotes uh, something other than just large data files of the kind we have been looking at okay so the the real area of big data processing big data analytics is fairly technology intensive and we have not really got into it in this course uh, for two reasons one is that uh, we don't have the technological background to get into it. And the second thing is that although there's a lot of hype around big data in the sense that I'm just going to talk about in the next minute or so, although there's a lot of hype around that, in reality, most organizations don't have that kind of big data, right? It's very large organizations like Google and Facebook and Yahoo and Twitter and all of these organizations have truly big data that they have to manipulate. Most of the time, when you're looking at business organizations, large data for them would be data sets that consist of a couple of million rows. That would be really, really large. And as we've already seen, that is something that we can actually handle using our regular computers. Okay, so it may not fit uh, into your average laptop, but a desktop with a little bit more memory can, you know, let's say 16 gigs of memory or 32 gigs of RAM, that can really handle two to three million rows of data, right? So most of the time, 99.999% of the data sets that we are likely to encounter, we can quite easily deal with using the techniques that we have covered, okay? But that said, let's uh, definitely at the end of a course called Big Data Analytics, you definitely need to have an understanding of what is big data beyond what we've just spoken about, okay? So now... <coughs> In, in terms of what we have done, the way things look is we've got data, okay? We load the data into the memory of a computer. So for example, when you're using R, we say read.csv and we read from a, or read underscore CSV, right? So the data was on disk. We read it into R, which essentially means that what we did was we took the data from disk, put it into the main memory of our computer. And of course, I've shown the data as zero ones because that's how data is actually stored on a computer in terms of zeros and ones. Okay, so we've got the data sitting in the main memory of our computer and then we process the data and get our results. Okay, so this is the, and of course the results, when I say we get the results, we see the results on the screen, we plot the results and so on. Okay, so the key point here is that you've loaded the data into the memory of your computer. Okay, so in that sense, this is called in-memory processing, right? So in order for R to be able to process your data, by process your data, I mean anything, right? You're applying some dplyr functions like group by, summarize, select, uh, mutate. You're doing all of these operations. Or if you're doing a model, like you're building a linear regression model or a decision tree model or a k-nearest neighbor model, or any of these things, naive based classification model, right? So we learned to build all of those models. In all of these instances thus far, everything that we have done has been in the form of in-memory processing. That is, the data has to be in the main memory of your computer before R can do anything with it, right? So that raises an important question. What if your data is just too big and won't even fit into the main memory of your computer, right? What do we mean by this? Let's say you've got your laptop, okay? So your laptop has a certain amount of RAM or random access memory or main memory, okay? So that RAM for your computer, I'm guessing, would be four gigabytes, okay? Or you might have a little extra, you might have eight gigabytes, you might even have 16 gigabytes of RAM 
on your laptop okay so in order to process data there is a limit of how much data your laptop can process let's say your laptop has 8 gigabytes uh, uh, 8 gigabytes of ram okay and of course in order for your computer to do anything there's got to be some operating system and you know some essential parts of the compute of the computer's processing capability have to be in main memory so let's say all of that takes up about one gigabyte of ram usually it'll take up a lot less than that but i'm just simplifying things right so you've got a total of eight gigabytes of memory one gigabyte is taken up by essential aspects right so after that what you would need to do is you've got seven gigabytes of ram left for other things okay let's say that all the seven gigabytes of ram is available for your data which means that you cannot process a data set that is larger than seven gigabytes so that's the point so when you have data that is too large to fit into the memory of the machine that is trying to process the data in one sense that is what people refer to as big data right now our current model is all the data is fits in the memory of your computer and there's a single process that is actually processing the data right by process I mean something that's going looking at the data and doing some computations on it so there's a single process now clearly if that's the scenario and your data is really really large then time becomes a constraint okay so that's one issue right that uh, time can become a constraint if you're processing the data with just a single process and of course the other constraint we've already looked at which is what if the data won't even fit into memory then you can't even begin processing it okay so those are some the two issues one is how big a data file can you process or how big a data set can you process and the second is well what if it takes too much time to process even if let's say even if it fits into the memory still when you're processing it you're using a single computer's processor it can take a lot of time to process which means that you start a job uh, processing you know you give an R command and what if the command takes three days to execute or takes even three or four hours to execute that might not be acceptable okay but like I said uh, even with the million rows uh, you can still manage most of what you're trying to do but we are talking about scenarios where we are the data is even much larger than that okay so that becomes a big problem right so in that sense the fact that all the data has to fit into the memory of the computer and you're restricted to using only the processing power of a single computer to process your data those are two big bottlenecks that we are facing okay so how do you break free of that big shackle that you're dealing with okay so the way you're going to break free of that is to operate with data that is on disk itself right that is not all the data has to fit into memory you may take chunks of data into memory do the processing uh, and put the results let's say back into memory or keep it in you know back into the disk and then read another chunk of data from the disk process it and so on and so on and then eventually put everything together and produce the result okay uh, the other thing is that you try to process the data simultaneously right so in other words typically our computers these days have even though they have one CPU a central processing unit they have what are called as multiple cores on the same CPU right in other words some number of processes can occur in parallel on your on our computers right so that's what we mean by cores. so if you're able to m exploit multiple cores that exist on your computer then you may be able to do some of the processing in parallel and not just sequentially of course the best would be that if you're able to literally harness many many computers in order to do the processing right so you have this large data set that you're trying to process let's say the data set is uh, in uh, several hundred gigabytes or even a terabyte in size right? so that's really huge you won't even be able to load that into a into an R system that's running on a single computer right because the, you don't have computers with terabytes of main memory on the other hand if you're able to divide this terabyte of data into many different chunks let's say into a thousand chunks or even into ten thousand chunks right? 
and then offload the analysis to 10,000 different computers, literally. Right? So you've got many computers, you give each computer a little bit of the job to do. Let each computer do its little bit of processing, send back its results, and then you uh, somehow put together all of the results and produce the final result. Right? So the benefit you're getting here is that, first of all, the data is broken up into many chunks. So you're dividing the task among many different computers. And secondly, all of these individual computers are operating in parallel, right? That is, uh, simultaneously, your work is going on uh, with 100,000 different computers. And therefore, data that, uh, you know, that, that would take, let's say, a couple of days to process can be processed in a matter of minutes because you have now divided the job among many different processes, right? So that's what we mean by breaking free of these kinds of shackles. Again, I emphasize one would very rarely encounter this kind of data set. It's very rare that we encounter this data sets that are this large. Okay, so that's what we're saying here, that the work goes on in parallel and you're able to, to separate the data into multiple components so that each uh, processor can process a small chunk of the data and then we put it all together. So sometimes this phenomenon is referred to as PEMA, Parallel External Memory Algorithm. Right? Parallel, which means the work is going on in parallel. All the processors are doing it simultaneously. We're not waiting for one chunk to finish and then another chunk to start. It's external memory, right, in the sense that not all the data is fitting into the main memory of the computer. Some of it is external. And algorithm, which is just a method of processing. So for example, we know how to do linear regression if all the data is available in the memory. But if all the data is not available in memory, then the process by which linear regression would have to be done by the computer has to be tweaked a little bit. Right? It's the old method of doing linear regression, assuming that everything in memory doesn't work, because only small chunks of the data can fit into the computer memory at one time. Right? So you'll have to load a chunk do some processing on it, load another chunk, do another processing on it, and then take the results of these several such processes, accumulate them in order to produce your final result. Right? So you need somewhat modified algorithms in order to perform uh, parallel external memory operations. Right? So, so there are some changes that are required, of course. Uh, it's a, there have been many advances in all of these areas, and today you've actually got systems that can do all of this. Okay, and as I've already pointed out, a Pima processes data in chunks. Okay, so as we already know, out of the box, R can only operate on data sets that fit fully into memory. Like this we understand. It does not, by, by default, it does not support parallel external memory algorithms. It assumes, that is the default R assumes all of this, which is not to say that this kind of work cannot be done in R. It can be. What I'm talking about is only the default version of R. There are additions, there are packages which are available in R which can remove all of these bottlenecks. Okay? So, like I've already pointed out, this looks like a serious restriction, but again, you know, how often are we going to encounter such large data sets that they not even fit into memory? Very rare kind of scenario. Okay? But when you have really large data, what do people do? Right? So, as I've already hinted, when you have a big data task, which means the data is really, really, really large, terabyte in size kind of stuff, right? So you need to process that. You may send the data to a computer for processing, but this computer is going to farm out the work to many other computers. Okay, so for example, it may use in this case, uh, you know, I've shown uh, seven computers, but again, I put a dot, dot, dot here. So this could be 5, 10, 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 any number of computers, okay? So this computer, computer zero, to whom you submitted the task or the computer on which you initiated the task will farm out the task into many different, too many different computers, right? And then once they all finish the job, it will do the assembly. So this, so now you're not talking about processing your data on a single computer, right? You're actually having many different computers working together to process your data. So in computing terminology, this is called as a computing cluster. So you have to create a cluster of computers which can be harnessed to process large data. Okay. So you have to create a cluster. Obviously, 
A cluster is not just a collect random collection of many computers. A cluster is a set of computers which have been properly connected with each other. There's some protocol in how they communicate. Right? So there is, for example, here you see this computer is somewhat like a master computer. And these computers are somewhat subordinate. You could call them slave computers. Right? So they are doing some jobs. So there's a lot of infrastructure that's required to set up a cluster. Okay, the good news is people have figured all this out. Uh, you've, uh, you've got operating systems like Linux and Unix and many other operating systems that understand clusters, that can handle clusters. So you can, uh, let's say you've got uh, 20 computers. You can create a cluster of those 20 computers and then you can do this kind of processing. So there is infrastructure available to do all of that. Okay, obviously, like I said, all of these have to be linked via a fast network. And once that is done, we get the parallel execution. That is, each of these computers can do part of the job and they can all be doing it simultaneously. We can shrink the amount of time required to do the processing. Okay, so the formal definition from Wikipedia of a computer cluster is a computer cluster consists of a set of loosely or tightly connected computers. Why, of course, when we mean loosely or tightly connected, we're not talking of physical connection between the computers, it's more like a network connection. So the connection is not, you know, that they're literally wired, uh, literally connected together by bolts and nuts, no. It's connected in terms of uh, being connected um, so that they can exchange data. Okay. So in many respects, this combination can be viewed as a single system. Okay. So this is just an example of a cluster. So each of these things that you're seeing here, individual things is a computer, right? So this whole thing may be several thousand computers connected into a single cluster. Okay, so to do cluster con computing conveniently, okay, you obviously need, first of all, something that is called as a distributed file system, right? In other words, uh, you need to be able to take a file which is very large and be able to physically break up the file across many physical disks, right? After all, disks also have size restrictions. You may have a disk that is, you know, a couple of terabytes large or even bigger than that. But what if your file is so big that it won't even fit into one single disk? Well, then you have to split the file across multiple disks. That is what is called as a distributed file system. Right, a file system in which a single file can be physically distributed across many hard disks. Okay? So, of course, once you've done that, after that, the file, when you're operating on it, looks just like a regular file that sits on one disk. But internally, the computer knows that the file is actually in many different places. Okay? So you need a distributed file system. And then, of course, you need a way by which the task can be managed properly. That is, in other words, you need the infrastructure to be able for one computer to distribute the tasks across multiple computers, make them do the job, get all the results back, accumulate the results and do all of that. Okay, that's what I call a distributed task management. So you need both of these capabilities before you can start doing this kind of cluster computing. Okay, of course in the initial days it was not easy to do this because you had to sit down and write the required infrastructure to do this which was extremely complicated. Today, fortunately, this is all figured out and uh, there are capabilities to do all of these things. Okay, so there are two important technologies which play a role in doing all of this. Okay, so the distributed file system uh, was recently, uh, there are many distributed file systems, but one that has come into prominence today is what is called as Hadoop. Okay. Hadoop was a technology that was initially developed uh, at least initially deployed in, in Yahoo and it's one way of, of distributing data. Uh, it's an example of a distributed file system. Okay, now why does this have an, a small elephant as a, as a logo? Well, the person who created it was looking for a name and uh, the same day he was looking for a name, he saw his, uh, his child's pet elephant. The name of that toy was Hadoop, so he just called his system as Hadoop. So that's what it is. So that's uh, Hadoop is an example of a distributed file system. Okay, and the file system it uses is called HDFS. 
And uh, another thing that comes with Hadoop is a method called map reduce. Okay, it's a way of uh, meaning it is some underlying functionality for being able to break up a task into multiple tasks, distribute it across multiple computers, and combine the results into a final result. Okay, so that's what is called as map reduce. Of course, we're not going into any of the details, but you might hear this terminology. Uh, so that's what I just want to make you familiar with. Okay, so basically what MapReduce does is you've got a main computer to which uh, you have submitted a task to be performed and the main computer takes care of distributing the tasks among other nodes. Okay, this process is what you call as map. Okay, so what this computer has now done is it has distributed the job across all of these other nodes, all of these themselves are computers, we're just calling them as nodes. Of course, the main computer is also just a node. So the task has been distributed across all of these computers. Okay, and each node, as I said, is assigned a part of the part of the overall task. And clearly, all of these nodes can work in parallel. Of course, uh, it goes without saying that all of these computers belong to a cluster. Okay, so once each each node finishes its job. It sends the results back to your main computer, the one to whom you submitted the job, and the main computer now collates all the results uh, from these individual results and produces the overall final result. So that step is what they call as reduce. Okay, so that's why the the main uh, method that uh, Hadoop uses is what is called as map reduce. Basically, reflects the fact that the main computer has to first. Uh, you know, partition the task into many different jobs and assign them to many different computers on the cluster. Once they all finish the job and give you back the results, the main computer has to uh, somehow combine all of those results and produce the final results. Okay. Now, the combination of how it combines the results, of course, that depends on the task that is being performed. Right? So, if it's a task of simply adding up all the, you know, if it's a sum function, right? then obviously it's going to give a chunk of the data to each of these nodes. They will produce their individual totals and the main computer simply has to find the master total and give the results. Right? On the other hand, if the job is not total, if the job on the other hand is computing the average, right? then each of these computers is going to give back its computed version of the average and this has to collate all of them and give the total average. Of course, the main average will, may not simply be the average of all of these, because each of these nodes might have received a different set, a different number, a set of different size, right? So this may have computed the average of 1 million rows. This may have computed the average of 2 million rows, right? So the main computer, when it's accumulating all the averages, has to apply appropriate weights to the individual averages, right? So this reduced part of it could be a simple process or it could be a complicated process. It all depends on the task that is being performed. Okay, so that's what MapReduce basically does. Okay, so here's an example of a Hadoop cluster at Yahoo. Okay, so clusters, as you can see, can be really, really large. Now, in this particular cluster, you're literally seeing racks and racks of computers, right? So in this particular rack, you've got, I don't know, maybe 20 or 30 computers sitting in this rack, and in this rack, and in this rack, and in this rack, and then all the shelves together. It is very possible that all of these computers belong to a single cluster okay so there's so many different processors cpus which are being thrown at every job we process okay now think of uh, for example google when you submit a, a search query to google right and then there are millions and millions of queries being submitted literally every second to google right and they're coming from all across the world now clearly tremendous amount of processing power is required to take care of all of that. So a single small computer just cannot cut it. And there are no single computers that are large enough to do that kind of work. You simply don't have individual computers that are that big. The only way then is to be able to put together small computers, make them work together so that together they all appear like a very, very large computer. Okay, so that's an example of Hadoop. Now, another technology that is becoming very prominent is this technology called Apache Spark. Now, incidentally, this whole of Hadoop technology is free. It's all open source, freely available for anybody to use. Similarly with Apache Spark. Okay? 
Apache Spark, basically if you want to use Hadoop out of the box, right? if you want to use Hadoop directly from uh, for yourself, then of course it requires a certain degree of programming knowledge and skill. Right? It's highly technology intensive. You have to uh, learn some technical details before you do that. Okay? Uh, now of course that may not always be possible. What Apache Spark does is it allows you to process your data stored in a Hadoop cluster and also in many other manners. Okay, Hadoop cluster is just one example. It can be stored in many other distributed file systems. And within Spark, you operate on things from a very high level. Okay, just like we have our functions to do various things. When you're working with Spark, you're just going to use some functions that they provide us. Right? So what Spark does is it allows us to completely forget about the fact that the data is actually physically highly distributed across a cluster. You don't worry about it. Spark takes care of all of those details. Right. So once you learn a little bit of Spark, uh, you will then be doing real big data computing. You could handle terabytes of data without really worrying about the minute details of how all of that clustering and distribution and mapping and reducing, how all that is done. Because Apache Spark will take care of all of that. Now, Apache Spark is also open source and free product that's available. Okay, uh, But of course, today to use Apache Spark, there's uh, you have to learn another language. Typically, the language is called Scala. We can do that. But fortunately for us, there is a package called Spark R, okay, which will allow us to use Spark or access Spark from within our R. Right? So you will install Spark R, and then you can just work inside of R itself. And R will connect to Spark, and Spark will then take care of all the other details. Okay, so Apache Spark is a nice platform uh, if, you are, if you end up in a scenario where you really have to do big data computing. Okay? Unfortunately, we don't have the time in our course <coughs> to get into Spark. Maybe at a later point in time, I'll offer a separate course on Spark itself. We'll have to see how much interest there is for something like that. Okay? So Apache Spark is a very important platform and uh, uh, well worth checking out if you have to do that kind of computing. Here we are just seeing the uh, overall architecture of Spark as it shows here. You've got the Spark core and it's got many application programming interfaces. So R is what I was speaking about earlier, Spark R. Now for those who know SQL, it's got all these connections. So if you know the Python language, you can access Spark through the Python interface or the Scala is another language or Java or SQL. Right? So there are many different ways, uh, paths from which you can access Spark. Okay, and Spark itself supports many different things. So, for example, Spark has this thing called SQL plus data frame, in which, if you know SQL, you can operate on Spark. Spark has streaming data, right, which means that uh, it's not all the time that the data you're processing is available in the form of a file, right? Many times the data you're processing is just flowing in as a continuous stream from various sensors, right? So for example, it might be temperature data, it might be other data. You've got sensors positioned all over the place and the sensors are just collecting data every second and streaming the data into Spark. Spark can also take care of streaming data. Of course, Spark has a complete machine learning library called MLib and machine learning is nothing but what we did in the previous course. Predictive analytics, classification, regression, all of those things. And Spark already has a library to do many of the things that we learned in the last class, right? So you don't, if you need to do, for example, linear regression on a very large file, as I had mentioned earlier, the process would be quite different uh, because of the need to separate the, uh, to distribute the job and then accumulate the results. Fortunately, we don't need to worry about any of that because uh, the MLib, machine learning library of Spark will take care of that. Okay. And finally, uh, there is a visualization engine called Graphics that is built on uh, top of Spark. And uh, you, know, you can use this to produce all sorts of visualizations on large data. Right? Remember, we learned how to do visualization, but we learned it for ggplot, which can only work with data that fits in memory. If you want to do visualizations on data that goes beyond that, then you would use Apache, and through Graphics, you'll get that capability. Okay. Of course, I'm not going into the details of 
uh, either the Hadoop technology or the Spark technology, but you understand the essential concepts that are involved here. First of all, the notion of uh, you know why you need to distribute the data across many disks, and why you need to distribute the processing across many computers when you have really, really large data. So you need to understand that. You need to understand the notion of a cluster, which is just nothing but uh, several computers connected together to, to work, to look like they are one large computer. That's a cluster. And then uh, understanding the fact that Hadoop is a distributed file system and Apache Spark allows us to uh, distribute uh, to, to exploit a distributed file system to do some of the things that we normally do with data analytics. Okay. So with that, we close uh, the lecture part of this course. Uh, of course, you know that I have posted a project, and the details of the project are given, are posted on Blackboard. You can take a look at that. Uh, for the rest of this week and for the whole of the next week, uh, you, can, you have time to work on your project. Of course, as always, you know, feel free to contact me for any clarifications on the project. Okay, so this is just the Spark code that I've spoken about. Okay, so that's all uh, in terms of lecture material for the course. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the class. I hope you found, uh, you learned a lot of useful things from this course.